One of the things that I'm going to touch on is that we were all born to be a little bit different. We were all not made completely clones of each other because we're all called to leave a different mark on this earth. We were all created intentionally different. And I think sometimes as presenters what happens is we get um, caught up in the way everyone else in our organization is building presentations or we feel like, well, I can't be different because then I'll stand out and then you know, if something bad happens at my corporation, I, I won't be hiding. And, and what happens is communicators in an organization, I am so sorry, I, this is taking a bit of time to load. I don't know if it's because there's so many people you on know. it. Anyway, we were all made to be a little bit different, and, and that's really intentional and really on purpose. And, and what happens is when we're afraid to stand out and be different, and when we want to keep going along the status quo, and we want to keep just making really bad PowerPoint because everyone else around us is making really bad slides, we have to be willing to stand out and be different. So as you move your way up the corporate ladder in your organization, you got to realize that one of the things that you need to do to develop as a person is to um, develop your communication skills. So, so I'm encouraging you through this presentation to actually stand out, to be different. There is no right or wrong way necessarily to do design, except it definitely needs to be a reflection of your own personality and temperament. Yeah. You guys should be able to see that, right? It's starting to come up. It's going okay, so, I think. Awesome. So you can mute now because there's a little buzz. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, cool. Catherine. So what I want to talk about a little bit is what you were like when you were little, back when you were tapped into who you are and how you expressed yourself. This is a photo, uh, this is a, excuse me, a painting that my niece made for my husband when she was just three years old. And I mean, granted, if you showed up and gave a presentation with this kind of illustration, it actually might be very memorable, but she's not afraid to express herself visually. It was like she couldn't give my husband this get well card without explaining a story. So my niece Cece has the green face and my husband has the purple face. And she gave him a bunch of balloons to help him feel better as a get well card. And the garter snake at the bottom startled him, and he let some of the balloons out of his hands and go towards the sun. What's really interesting about her storytelling abilities is that she has, um, she has, is not embarrassed, number one, but she has a little story arc. She has uh, characters in it. They are a little conflict or trauma that happens, and then it resolves. So what's happened is she's super proud of herself, and that's a, that's a really good thing. And, and, and she doesn't see anything wrong, or she doesn't feel intimidated at all by her illustration style. So what's happened now is she is in the first grade, and she is a writer and illustrator, and she wrote her first little book. And only 12 books in her school were picked, it won an award, and they, it was featured at the Santa Clara County uh, Fair, and only 12 books were. So here she is now, an accomplished uh, author and illustrator. So she wrote and illustrated this book about the happy hummingbird. So again, she's actually a pretty talented little kid. So she wrote this story about this hummingbird, super, super happy. You can see the crow at the top flying by, and the crow hates the hummingbird singing. The hummingbird is super happy, and all of the hummingbird friends love the hummingbird singing. But what happens is the crow comes and attacks the hummingbird. All the crow's friends, all of the hummingbird's friends, excuse me, try to tackle the crow and the butterfly beats the crow as hard as he can. And you can see here the crow coming in. You see the little hummingbird behind the pink flower, just this little beak and feet. It's so cute. So the crow's pretty persistent, and the crow again catches the hummingbird. But this time, the butterfly hits the hummingbird really, really hard. And here we have the butterfly slapping the crow, and because uh, the crow has caught the hummingbird. And the butterfly slapped it over and over and slapped it hard enough that it scared the crow away. And at the end, the hummingbird and all of his friends were very, very happy. So you can see that she's really pleased with this. The story was really good. It had a story arc. It had some conflict in the middle, which every good story has a little bit of conflict in the middle. And here, the part that was the most interesting for me about this whole book was the About the Author page, where Cece wrote about herself. She says, Cece is very good at singing, reading, math, and writing. What's fascinating to me is that she never put illustration or she never put drawing. Yet here she won a prize, only 12 kids that won a prize whose work was featured at, this, at the county fair, and she didn't even put drawing in there. So already, it's such a little girl. She's comparing herself to other people and comparing herself to other people in the class that can draw, and she already doesn't, already doesn't have it on her list of top five things that she can do, but she won a prize for it. 
So this intimidation about how good of a visual communicator we are starts at a very young age. And we need to be very careful to stir back up that gifting, no matter how good or bad it was, and to get really gutsy in how we present ourselves and, and the stories that we tell. So what's happened now is CC is going to wind up growing up, and at about the fifth grade, she'll be introduced to PowerPoint, and that's how she'll start to communicate her visual stories. Well, that's kind of frightening. And so I asked another student if they would uh, write for me a story. And that was my daughter, who just finished college this year. Here she is knitting at graduation, double degree science um, in science, uh, biology, and chemistry. And when I asked Rachel, I said, you know, make the worst PowerPoint file you can, just a really messed up PowerPoint file. So even though she just finished college, she could do a really good job really screwing up a PowerPoint file. So here's what I had her do. It's like people at the company actually think uh, that my husband and I used to tuck our daughter into bed like this, where it's, hey, Dad, will you tell me a bedtime story? OK, let me just fire up my projector. So I'm going to show you a set of slides. And if I was in person, what I would do is I would turn my back to you so that I could read out loud this bedtime story of Little Red Riding Hood. So here's Red Riding Hood. This is her networking strategy used as a platform for the mobile muffin business. I'm just going to read you my slides. <laughs> Red's mission, take home mo homemade muffins to grandma's house in woods that are suspiciously dark and gloomy and feature a notoriously evil wolf. Note, avoid the potentially pedophilic woodsman who carries an ax. Red's time allocation, baking, walking, talking, consuming. Areas for improvement, don't get eaten by wolves. Visit grandma more so she's easily recognized as the real grandma and not a fake wolf grandma. Utilize Ziploc bags for a muffin freshness and write a thank you note to the heroic yet still creepy, creepy woodsman. We do this to our stories, and it's like, what the heck? What the heck was that? That wasn't a story. That was the butchering of a really great fable that could have been told really well. So what's happening in, a, in a corporations and in education today is we're taking these really sweet and great stories, some of the best corporate stories of innovation that we've ever had to tell in our history, and we are hacking it up when we introduce PowerPoint. It's almost like PowerPoint becomes this filter that ruins the way that we connect with people, and that's not good. And what's happened now is the baseline of expectation for our presentations is set so low because there's so much crappy PowerPoint. There's oceans and oceans of crappy PowerPoint out there that we just keep going along with the flow instead of bucking against the system and really standing out. And it's gotten to the point where at Oracle World last year, they actually had a whole building dedicated as a no-slide zone where people were not allowed to break their slides in. Well, that's one extreme. You know, we can be real like Luddites and just throw the tool out. Or the other extreme is, look at what happened to Al Gore with his slideshow. He ran around the country with a laptop under his arm, and he caught the attention of Hollywood. He won an Academy Award. And then he also won a Nobel Peace Prize. So here on one side of the extreme, we have people tossing out PowerPoint. And on the other extreme, we have you know, the former Vice President of the United States creating the most magnificent tipping point that's ever happened in our history for a long, long time, where he's completely mobilized the world around a single cause, all done with a presentation tool. Now, he used Keynote, so sorry, I used PowerPoint interchangeably there. So what we need to do is we need to own the fact that our own personal character is being challenged by this application, and our commitment to making it excellent is in our hands. So we could either be on the end of the oceans of the really bad PowerPoint, or we can be a real change agent if we use it right. So here's what's happening. This is a spectrum of the different ways presentation software is used. On the left, you can use a presentation software as a document. Now, if you've created a document where you have a lot of words and a lot of pictures on a slide, call it a document, distribute it as a document, and let people read it. But what happens is, because we've created a document using presentation software. We just assume that we have to present it, and we don't. But you don't want to run out and learn Adobe's InDesign or some of these more complicated applications. The only application that you have that uses words and pictures the most of the time is a presentation application. But in reality, you've generated a document. So if we could get in the habit of saying, hey, here's my document, read it, and let's just meet about it, instead of standing up, turning our back to the room, and reading it, that just makes a lot more sense. So most of corporate America uses it as a teleprompter. So what happens is they're, they're making a presentation from the context of what they need on the slide versus what the audience needs on the slide to remember. 
So presenters will use their slides as a dumping ground to put everything in there that they need so that every word or every little picture that serves as a device for them to remember what to say gets thrown on the slide and then it's there to prompt the presenter. But in reality, if you're really building a presentation, you should only have things on the slide that are there for the audience that serve as a mnemonic device for them to remember what you have to say. And that takes an investment on your part as a presenter to learn the material well enough so that the, so that the slides are seamless behind you. They're not a big distraction and people aren't reading what you're saying. You're not all reading along together. Instead, there's just pictures, images, and really clear ways to communicate what you're, what you're trying to say. So here's a great, I love Gar Reynolds of Presentation Zen. It was this blog post that had me fall in love with him. So everyone should subscribe to his blog because it's very, very good. So a typical evil, you know, good and evil. You got here Darth Vader using lots of bullet points. You, I am your father. Search your feelings. It's hysterical. Whereas Yoda has open space, he's open-minded, and he's the wise one. Well, that's great, but that's fantasy, right? Darth Vader and Yoda, or, or it is it. We've also got here um, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. You got lots and lots of bullets. Not that Bill Gates is evil, but I think the way he uses his own tool in some ways is, is wrong. It's not good. It's not well done. So um, this isn't really fair because Steve, you know, he doesn't have anything behind him. But what's interesting about the way Steve uses it is, is it's really transparent. Steve and his slides are transparent. It's like when Steve's on the stage, he's still the star, even when his products are beautiful behind him. So in fairness, I thought I should show content on the slide. So here's the migration of Microsoft's uh, platform on the left and the migration of Apple's on the right. So still you can see that there's a very zen, open-like um, way that Steve interacts with his slides, and he shows information over time versus showing everything at once. So what the problem is today is that when the audience is there and they're engaged, so often the slides are the star and what's going on the stage and what's being projected is the star. In reality, that's a little, little bit backwards. Really, it's all about the audience. Sometimes we think it's about the slides or we think it's about ourselves. In reality, it's really about the people who've come to hear us speak. So where we need to start is in a blank space, with white space, with open space. We need to step away from the computer and clear our minds and clear our heads. But instead what happens is we double click on an application and this default screen pops up. And this default screen is telling us, click here and put a title and click here and put bullets. Well, that, <laughs> who says that that's the way to start your slide? Who says that is? Microsoft? Is that who we really want to be emulating? Probably not. So instead we need to start with blank space. And like I said, step away from the computer. Go into an environment that's completely different for you. So here's a picture of Salvador Dali in the bathtub. So it makes you wonder if that's maybe where he got the inspiration for the, all the drippy pictures in his uh, paintings. So I bet you if you stepped in the bathtub next time you have an important presentation and you just thought about it, your presentation would probably be twice as effective because you've changed your environment and that really um, mentally does makes a big difference. Oh, these pictures are kind of messed up, it's funny. So the other thing you can do is brainstorm with sticky notes. And when you've generated an enormous amount of ideas, classify them, sort them, and try to see if there's this natural structure. And that's a very good way. I build a lot of presentations. Actually, I started the book um, as sticky notes on my wall, just thinking through what should be included and what the structure should be. Another important thing is, is to brainstorm. It's so easy to go to the easy cliche. For the word partnership, you know, we could do a handshake in front of a globe. That's just such a cop-out. That's what everyone does for partnerships. But you can see here, this is a brainstorm around other ways to show partnerships. You got everything from Batman and Robin to salt and pepper to peas in a pod. And what's interesting is those nuances around these other kinds of partnership, partnerships, like a rainforest or an ecosystem, they all have nuances to it that can strengthen the metaphor you're using as partner. It could actually tell a secondary story about your partnership it's actually very meaningful because of the metaphor you used for partnership. But what you need to do, you can see partnership still here in the middle. This is another way someone here brainstormed it. He went all the way to the fringe. I mean, you can see here on the outside he's got fuel. You know, what does fuel have to do with partnership? I also had to blur part of it because it got rated R in here, but I had to blur it out. So 
so there's no lawsuit there. But you can see if you backtrack from the word fuel, you have fuel. To the left, you have cars, the wheel, caveman, club, team, partnership. So he went all the way to the fringe. And it doesn't make anything he's got here wrong. It was just a way for him to stretch his mind into a space it wouldn't have naturally gone if he hadn't sat and done this just completely crazy mind map. So today I want to talk about the four principles for creating a great presentation. And the first one is really important, and that's being able to tap into that childlike part of you that I was talking about and learn to how to tell great stories. I hope you guys are still able to follow along. Anyway, anyone, I'm sure, on the phone, if I were to ask you to raise your hand, I bet most of you would raise your hand and say you've seen traditional slides like this about us. And under about us, this is a typical presentation structure. You've got the company history, the market cap, how many employees you have, how many locations, your vision statement, about the product or service, what it is, how it works, why it's better than the alternative. And if you're really lucky, you'll remember to put a call to action in there so the people know what they're supposed to do with all this great information you gave them. Well, this is all about you. It's all not about the audience, and you're pronouncing information on the audience. And that's not an effective way to communicate. So instead, <clears throat> I got all jammed up here. Um, so instead, what we do is we try to put all kinds of crud on the slide. This is an intelligent retail network as the foundation for retail interaction from consumer to supplier. You know, what the heck is that? That's just as bad as a big set of bullet text. What, what are we trying to communicate here? Really, what slides are supposed to do and presentations are supposed to do is they're supposed to inform, inspire, and persuade, whereas this example really does none of that. So what we did that was interesting is we took this slide and we turned it into a story. So I want to read for you the story that this, we turned this slide into. It's called Hop To It. So I'm going to read this script to you because I didn't have to memorize this because it wasn't my presentation. So here we have Dave. And Dave is the president of a large microbrewery. And he has won more regional beer competitions than anyone else. And he is gearing up for his next one, confident that his award-winning recipe will land him another victory. Unfortunately, though, while gearing up to brew a batch of his new beer for the competition, he discovers his secret ingredient, his prize hops, have not arrived. Just then, Dave's supply chain manager receives a notification. The shipment of hops has been delayed in customs, and the network has detected it. The message to the 3PL partner, and it has routed it to Dave's brewing company. Now Dave has big problems. His hops haven't arrived. There's no telling how long they'll be held up in customs. He needs to launch his new brew at the competition because he is depending on the press coverage to make it a top seller this year. That, they let this build. I hope it's building fast enough. That, plus, he has shut down part of his operation in anticipation of the event. If he can't make, uh, so that his revenue will be lost if he can't make his deadline. But there may be a solution. On the other side of the country, another hop supplier has had a bumper year and still needs to unload his product before it goes bad. What will happen to Dave? Will he be able to defend his title? Will the competition organizers be able to draw the crowds they need? Will the alternate hop supplier find his customer? Find out in the exciting conclusion. So what we did is we left a cliffhanger at the beginning, and then you can go through the technical geeky stuff. So I know there's a lot of probably techno geeks on the phone today, because I think some of O'Reilly's customer base feeds that, and it might be uncomfortable to go into the storytelling mode. So many times we go right into the, the technical, how to solve it technically, because that's what's most interesting to us as technical people. But in reality, other people connect to the product based on seeing it as a solution like this story. So once we built this front end, the middle part had all the techno geek data, and then we came back to it. When we last left our heroes, all was not well. Fortunately, when the shipment was stopped at customs, Dave and his team were notified immediately. The production manager uses XMII to determine the exact shortage based on the new recipe, then checks potential sources at either key suppliers through his secure network connection. He identifies the alternate hop supplier, indicates the needed quantity, and appropriate variety in places in order. 
The grower sales rep receives the order and uses presence to find the available production supervisor and clicks to connect to him, confirming that he can ship the hops right away. The domestic supplier confirms the ship date with Dave, who's able to confirm his comp participation in the competition, which of course he wins again. Which, oh, there he is, winning. I was not even redrawing on my screen. So what, what's happening here is we've actually taken a very dry topic and turned it into a story with a cliffhanger right in the middle. And so the big thing here is, is the content structure. Um, when you're putting together content, you have to have a really clear structure. And there are a lot of really cool tools out there that you can use. This right here is a file folder that Decker Communications puts together. And when you use little sticky notes, you can actually think through what the structure is of your presentation. The really cool thing about um, using this uh, tool is that it makes you stay at about a 10,000 foot view. It, it won't, the sticky notes are so small, you can't get into all kinds of detail. And so it's better to, to keep it at the big picture view because you're talking about just structure, like an infrastructure. Another really great tool is Cliff Atkinson's Beyond Bullet Points. And you can see here, um, he usually has you determine who the protagonist and antagonist is. And you can see on the left where he wants you to break it down into a three-act play. So you have a place in red there, you can see the three acts. And then you put in the explanation. And then you can put in the detail. So basically, if I were to have a presentation that had a five-part structure, I need to think through it. Now, structure is kind of interesting because everyone wants structure. And there, it, structures can be built all kinds of different ways. It can be chronological. It can be um, you know, based on a story arc. There's all kinds of ways to build structure. But no matter who you are, you are wanting structure. So I have a compare and contrast here. I've got my creative director there on the left, Michael Moon. And he and I are as different as you can be, besides the fact that I have hair and he doesn't. There's a lot bigger differences than that. But he's really analytical, and I'm not. I, don't, I think I'm, I'm visual and creative, but I'm not analytical. He'll talk with his pen, and I talk with my hands. He's definitely the smartest guy in the room, whereas I pretend to be the smart person in the room. And the big difference, too, is I love to hug people, and he's trying to get used to being hugged. So I think that what it is is we, we do love, both love a really good martini, though. I think that's one thing we have in common. But all of this is to say the one thing that he and I adamantly agree on is that every presentation should have a structure. And while you're listening to the presentation, the audience is trying to figure out, what is this structure? I just sat through a presentation this weekend where the presenter meandered so much, I actually was agitated. And it was supposed to be this inspirational presentation. And I was agitated. So whether you have stories or anecdotes in your presentation or not, if I'm in the audience and I'm listening, and I'm more on the creative side, whereas Michael says I'm more on the analytical side, it doesn't really matter. As your content is coming you know, at the audience, it definitely needs to hang together in some way with a clear structure. Now, it could be a three-act play. It can be a five-point sermon, like whatever it is it needs to be. But as the audience, we need to be guided by you on this journey. and We need to be able to see what you're saying as you go along. And then what you do, once you have your basic structure of what is the journey you want to take them on, <clears throat> excuse me, what the journey is you want to take them on, then you go back to the structure and you start to add narrative, argument, like logical argument, demo, pitch. You start to add those in afterwards. So I want to go through those four story structures for presentations right now, the narrative, argument, demo, and pitch. So the way you know if you have a narrative story is usually there's characters that are clearly identified. And, and most of the times, they have a name so that you can follow them through. And it has a storyline and a story arc. And, and usually somewhere in the story for it to keep interest, there's some sort of contrast or conflict that's happening. Now, with all the analyticals on the phone, I know this is a bit of a struggle. So I get this question a lot, mostly from scientists and engineers and physicians and stuff. It's like, if you really want me to tell a story, my credibility is going to be ruined because a story is fiction. And that's not necessarily true. I also hear that, hey, stories don't come naturally for me, and I don't want to. Well, I kind of want to challenge that, because I know when you guys were all little and you were playing with your, your Legos, in your head you had a storyline going on. As you built the character, and you probably built a second one, and they probably battled each other, and one of them exploded into a million pieces on the floor. But even when we were little, 
we actually naturally had the ability to tell stories as we created. And that's what I'm encouraging is for you to find, you could take a router and, and make a story about the little router that could, but there's got to be a way that you can um, take the content, no matter what industry you're in, and wrap a story around it so it resonates with the audience better. So that's narrative. The next kind of story is a logical argument. <clears throat> a lot of times, I mean, you shouldn't argue. Obviously, it shouldn't come across as an argument. But this is where you're trying to appeal to the analytical side, where you use pictures and stories, or a story about the research that you did to get to the point that you are, where you're walking them through a logical path to, for them to reach the same conclusions that you did. Then <laughs> there's the bathomatic, uh, the demo. Demonstrating your product is the best way to um, to promote it or to sell it. Now, what's interesting about, uh, I had an interesting conversation last week with a, a client, and they were like, okay, so I took screenshots of my application and put it into PowerPoint. I was like, wow, what does your application actually do? And they're like, oh, it's this really cool thing, and it's very visual. And when you put new data in it, it replots the data, and right there live over real time, as the data in the database is changing, the, the, the screen is changing. I'm like, why the heck are you not doing a demo? Like, it was just the deal breaker is this application. And and they weren't going to show the application. So always demo your product. Very important. And the last thing is the pitch. So if I was pitching a, a screenplay in Hollywood and I was to say, OK, there's this crazy mad scientist. And in it also is this uh, remote ex ex <coughs> excluded island. And there's these bugs. And they're trapped in amber. Oh, yeah. And it's a family movie with a bunch of kids in it. Well, I could do a 20-minute pitch about this movie, or I could tell you, well, it's Jaws, but, but with dinosaurs. And what happens is you associate a known thing with this new thing, and suddenly this new thing that you're pitching has enormous amounts of meaning, and that's the pitch. So if we go back and visit our structure where we basically put in uh, the basic content, and we've organized it in a meaningful way. Now what you can do is you can start to add your stories. So here I've added a meta-narrative. So what you can do, and I've heard you, I'm sure you've heard presenters do this, where they take a story, and they only tell the beginning at the beginning. They may tell the middle, and then they have an end. I think the um, hops example with Dave in it is one that um, serves this purpose. So there was this bigger meta-narrative that happens, and that's a very powerful way to present. And then at some point in your presentation, you really should build in conflict or contrast in some way so that the audience starts to feel a little conflicted, like, wow, now I'm at the edge of my seat because I can totally see how my life isn't going to be as great if I don't do this thing or join this cause or, or buy this product. So you have to identify where in your structure the place for conflict makes the most sense. And then you can actually make other story points of story, and I, I'm just making this up. This doesn't mean that narrative was always in the first part or demos in the third. But what this means is then you pick places to do micro stories or, or smaller narrative stories, and, and where's the right place for demo, and, and at what point should I really walk them through a logical uh, step, and, and at what point should I do a pitch? Well, there, sometimes you might not ever have some of these components, and this is just a, a made-up version of a, of a structure and story of a presentation, but it's really important to think through these things as a structure when you're putting together your presentation. So another principle for creating a great presentation is to show people, not just have bullets up there, but actually show them what's going on. <clears throat> so I have a friend who owns this brilliant bakery. It's this, she's a great big company, super successful woman-owned company. And she came to me and said, hey, I've got this big presentation I'm doing to a major coffee chain, and I need some help. So she sent me her slides, which were just a disaster. They're just hideous, as you can see. But as I went through the content, I realized that the most important slide was this product solution slide. Everything else, this was the meat and the guts of it. And here she crammed it all on one slide. So what I did is we actually, so here's the slide big. So what I did is I called a Monday morning. I used our Monday morning staff meeting. I projected this slide, and I just had the staff, hey, just sit draw, create ideas. You can just write words. You can do a word map. Whatever you want to do, I just want you to create ideas around this slide. And they did. So here's some just random ideas. And I circled in orange the things that we actually adopted in the final solution. So here it's got, hey, why don't you return to the original success plan? Um, in this particular case, um, the 
coffee chain that she was selling into was very, very successful at coffee, but their pastry strategy was kind of all over the place. Like you could go from store to store and not um, get, have the same pastry experience. And they were trying to get everyone to go with really fresh, um, natural and organic ingredients in all of the products. And so this was like, hey, let's, let's give a nod to the history and how successful they've been with coffee. And let's see, hey, you've done it before. Can we do it again? And what's next? <clears throat> Here is one illustration from one of my, you can see the quality of these sketches isn't great. But this is one, and I could tell what it was. It's the aerial shot of coffee with steam coming out. And the other one is a muffin on a napkin with crumbs and text on it. So when you're generating ideas, they don't have to be perfectly refined. You just need to generate a lot of ideas. So this process was what we call a quick storm here, where there's no real big creative brief or anything. There's just one little problem you're trying to solve. And I only gave them 15 minutes to generate as many ideas as possible around the concept. So here someone else had a napkin with the background with crumbs on it and a shopping list, which is really interesting. So many coffee shops are near um, grocery stores, and, and sometimes people do come in with their big list of coffee they need to buy. And then this is basically a cow about to eat some grass. So what they're saying is that they, for their pastry company, they care all the way back to what the cow is eating to make sure it's organic so that it's making the best butter, which creates the top premium kind of muffin, which ultimately makes the customer happy. And then this is funny. Here's the before where everything is a mess and every, you know, there's no real clear strategy. To here is the after slide where you can see the grass and, and the baked goods with the chefs. And, and they've got this little linear line going through the back of it, which I really liked that. And it was in this proposed idea, too. So you can see here from grass, kind of like the cow that eats the healthy grass, from the grass all the way through the bonus is kind of like cradle to grave. Um, as a concept, which is really cool. And then you can see failing fast and getting back up on your path. <clears throat> All of those were very inspired ideas. So we took this collection of ideas and turned it into a storyboard. So you can see it's all sketched out. And I'll just flip through these quick. You can see some of the ideas, the grass, the bonus, and other things are here. So I want to walk you through the final solution. <clears throat> see the bottom left there, this person's kissing a muffin and all these great fresh ingredients that go into the muffin is why they love it. So you can see the fruit of some of the brainstorm in there. And then it needs to look as good as it tastes. So <clears throat> I want to walk you through the final solution here. I, I don't know if it's going to animate. I think the power of this thing is, is how it animates and creates a sense of space. And I don't think that's going to translate through WebEx, but maybe WebEx will do an update and an upgrade. So, But what we did is we picked a background color that was like unbleached flour since um, this bakery uses all organic materials. And um, <clears throat> here you see we actually went and picked up a napkin and the coffee and actually tore up a um, pastry and shot this. Now, this image would not be anywhere on a stock photography site. So you can't just go straight to stock photography. You need to step back, generate the ideas, and then you may have to generate an image that makes the most sense because you can't find these images at a stock house. <clears throat> so you can see here. We've implemented all of the, um, a lot of the ideas from the quick storm. So when you talk about the state of, I, state of the business, where sales are declining and customers aren't super excited, and then there's a lack of leadership engagement. So that's a very intriguing way to incorporate that big scribble that, um, that one of the artists had come up with. So it still shows the state of the business. So here's Think Grass to Bonus. So what you can't see is in the original file. These all pushed to the left, so it looks like your eye is panning one great big scene, and it's one continuous line through all of these um, slides, which is actually really lovely. So this is Collaborate and Leverage Expertise. So we used a braided um, bread to show working together and collaborating. Know your market and where you are in it. It's a typical kind of scatter plot there. Choose a course and stick to it. So these are those 10 tenants that were on that one slide of what they were proposing needs to happen. Here's the happy customer that's kissing the bun. Well, we had to shoot that, too, because obviously that doesn't exist. Have to look as good as it tastes. And cold fat is bad, but warm fat is good, <laughs> which is a great image. And then we talk about risk and reward and how, how the team needs to fail fast, recover, and end the you know, period of failing with recovering at a much higher plane or plateau than they were at before. 
very different. Here's the shopping list. So all these ideas, the, the presentation was much longer. This is just a subset of it. But you can see how many ideas were generated from that brainstorm that were used. So creating ideas that show them instead of tell them. It was more powerful to have this series of 10 slides than it was to have one slide with 10 bullets on it. And it's going really, really well. So that's really exciting. So here's um, a presentation that we did for a doctor. And he is presenting, um, <clears throat> he's presenting his concept for home-centered health care to a lot of government officials and government institutions. And because he's um, scientific, he's a physician, he, he wasn't really tapping into the emotional appeal about home-centered health care. So when we talked to him, it was really interesting. He, we could hear in the background, like, kids running around, and they were his grandkids. And we were like, well, if, if, do you have any family stories we could tell about your personal experience around home-centered health care? And he's like, yeah. So what we did is we connected him to his own stories that he could tell, and then we used those stories to wrap around this whole presentation. So in this particular uh, story, this is his, a picture of his father-in-law, who actually died at a pretty young age with 10 children at home. And so you can see we used a, a photo of his real family and then, you know, blacked it out to show that father's absence because this created an enormous strain on his wife's family that they had to live with. <clears throat> so what we did to personalize it is each section of the presentation, we tried to find textures that are in your home, like leather, wood grain, um, fabric. So each section had its own home-like texture. And you can see here where there's no title, there's no bullets. Um, Here's a wood grain, and it looked like that you would find in a home, and it looked like we took an opaque pen and drew right on the wood grain. So again, we're not following the infrastructure that PowerPoint says we should, which is to have a title and bullets. We're just obliterating that and actually using it to express what we want to want to express. So here's a, a presentation that we did around Java, and it's just an alphabet soup of acronyms that nobody knows what they are. So in this case, we went out and bought some tomato soup and some alphabet soup, put the tomato soup in a bowl, and picked out all the letters and actually wrote this and then took a picture of it. That would not exist as a stock house. And this was before we had a studio. This was a few years ago. So this was just done like we laid down a piece of paper and, and shot a photo. So anybody can do this. Now, data can tell a story, too. What, um, what's interesting about this is the left column here is, is background, OK? So, there's three components to any data slide. There's the background, the data, the emphasis, and then the end result. So if you look at the background, it's really tertiary information. It's context, and it's not actual data itself. Now, granted, there is data on the axes and information on the axes. But when you're talking about a presentation, the most important thing you're talking about is the meaning behind the information or the results that the information need to um, convey. So in this case, what we um, like to do is mute the background of the axes and the uh, grid out. Just mute it out as much as you can. And then you plot the data on top of it. Now the data gets plotted, but then you pick, what, why am I showing this data? What is the meaning I pulled from this data that made me feel like I should present it? Well, then you pull the results, the, the emphasis of the data out, and then the result is a slide presentation that has the context of the background and the data, and then it shows the results in a different color. So this is like a schematic for how we should do it, and then I have a sample here for how data can tell a story. So what's wrong with this right here is that you can see the background elements are in black. Now black is the biggest contrasting color to white, right? So they've put a um, black grid in the background and black axes, and then we would propose that those get muted out a little bit. Now, the next secondary most contrasting color is the red. So if you look at that you, cold, you're thinking, OK, there's some sort of story here in the red numbers. And then the gray would be the least important, right? The other thing that's hurting on this information is if you look at the, one of the middle charts there at 30.5, the 2,000 plot, it's weird because 30, it hits the 30 line, but the back of the uh, bar hits just above the 30.5 line. So charts that are extruded or in 3D are very confusing and can skew information. So I have seen firms intentionally use this to skew the information to look like they're performing better than they really are. 
I don't recommend that. I think it's uh, not telling the truth in your data. But if I show you what we wound up doing with this, you'll see that it wound up telling a different story. The grid lines in the back are muted. The part on the previous slide that was red is now gray because that wasn't the most important part. The part they were trying to get everyone to focus on was the last three years, but the most important part <laughs> of all was the moment in time where they hit $30 billion. That was the real story, was when they recovered back after the kind of the boom. And it was those recovery years that they were talking about in this presentation. So it, it actually does tell a story, but you have to guide the um, audience to what you're wanting them to focus on and what the takeaway is from a chart. So even charts do tell a story. So the next principle for creating a great presentation is to deliver a profound experience. Everyone came to hear you. They came to see you, and they came to hear you present. And so we need to not be, have the setting that we're in, or the slides. I call slides a setting sometimes. We need to not have them be a distraction. And you need to be your best, and you need to be as prepared as possible. So it would be like attending a Madonna concert and Madonna not be prepared or ready to go. And even a keynote from Steve Jobs, it wouldn't even be of any value if he wasn't there. So they've come to see you. They didn't come to see your slides. But it's really important that you learn to interact with your slides. I think one of the things that makes Steve so great is he can stand up on the stage with or without his slides, and it would be just as amazing and appealing because he's seamless with his slides. He's learned to um, ingest the content so well that it, it's just seamless, that nobody knows what's going on. Nobody, knows, nobody notices his slides or his interaction with them. Now I have an interesting sample here because this is one of the few times that I really like the way this guy interacts with his slides and he actually turns his back to the audience too. So I really encourage you guys to spend some time up at TED.com. It's a phenomenal conference and a guy named Hans Rosling did a presentation there and um, he had a lot of data to get through and he had built an application that would go in and hit the content of the database. It was called Gapminder and Google's acquired it since then. But what it could do is take enormous amounts of information. In this case, it went from, I think, 1950 to 2005 or six, And, and as it, as it um, had the data change over time, it, it would show what the data looked like in 1950, 1955, 1960, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65. And as the data moved, as the content in the database changed, the screen and the content on the screen changed. And it was this very... Um, amazing presentation. Now, he could have taken screenshots like this and showed them static in PowerPoint, but instead what he did is he turned his back to the audience and he had, and he kind of danced before, I don't know how to explain, but he had this um, line of um, verbiage that went with it where he told a story of what was going on in the global economy with global politics and you could actually watch as this data transformed on the screen you could actually see what was going on, and his dialogue that went along with it is just absolutely fascinating. That's probably the only person I've ever seen turn their back to the audience where it became more intriguing. He was almost like Mary Poppins where he jumped into the data and explained what was going on. It was really, really good, and I encourage you guys to watch it. It's the only time I would say that you should turn your back and talk to the slides. So it is really interesting what's happening today is presentations have become this application or almost a platform, for lack of a better word, where you can create content once and it can have enormous reach. So right now presentations are going everywhere, like even this webcam, web uh, conference is a real tribute to the kind of reach that a presentation can have today. So what's happening now is we're pushing the content into devices and phones and, and other places that the presentation applications didn't originally design them to go. So when you're sitting on your IP phone, you, you can have a presentation delivered to you. What's interesting about that is you can't go with small text and tiny images. You really have to think through the different way your slides are going to be conveyed. So when they're put onto an iPod or an iPhone, they have to be designed quite a bit differently because it won't translate to a small screen. A lot of presentations are becoming components of bigger uh, framed in um, web apps or in microsites and even sent to phones now. So presentations, the reach has just gone astronom astronomically exponential. So there's a, a lot of social networking kind of sites, too, that are putting presentations up there. And there's one presentation up there that's uh, from a blog, and it's called Shift Happens. 
And it's a really great presentation. It's 675,000 people have watched that presentation. I, I just don't know very many presentations that have been viewed that many times, which is a real tribute to um, social networking. And so I wanted to show you one that a friend of mine did. And this isn't the one that got the 675 views, but this is Gar Reynolds' um, submission he put to SlideShare. So you can see it looks just like YouTube. So it's like YouTube for presentations. And you can see how you can click through the slides. Now, on the bottom right, you can see this one of 131 slides. So at first, you're like, holy cow, I don't want to sit through 131 slides. But um, Gar and some of the people up at um, SlideShare, if you go and look, they've come up with this new form factor where you can click, and it's very intriguing. So at the time of this, um, when I did the screen capture, 46,000 people almost had viewed it. But now 141,000 people have viewed this book review. 141,000 people watched this presentation that he did about the book Brain Rules. That, it, it just doesn't get any better than that when you're trying to get a book out. So he does this layout that's really great. He uses pictures. Hello, my name is Biff. And Biff became a host for this entire online version of a presentation. So here he has a character and a, and a, um, a narrative in his presentation. And then Biff introduces um, Dr. John Medina, who wrote the book. Um, you know, and Dr. Uh, Medina knows how these works. work. So you can actually see how you can click, 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 click really fast, and it's a rapid clicking. And it, I can get through 131 slides and read through this presentation in less than five minutes. But I think because I'm the one that's in control and I'm the one that's having to click, it's a very intriguing and interesting way to give a presentation. I also had this really cool experience uh, on the bus from the aquarium at the TED conference this year, I sat next to this very wonderful man who had just gotten back from a mission trip in Africa. And when he got back to the States after this missions trip and he saw so many people without healthy, clean water, his birthday happened to fall the very next month. And he had this empty feeling inside, like, I just can't accept gifts from these people when I know, you know, not too far away is this entire continent with hardly any water. So that year for his birthday, he asked people, instead of giving him money, could they donate uh, funds? And he would dig a well in Africa. And now he has a thriving charity that's actually doing very well. And I think they are, um, they're building their 333rd well uh, this month, in the month of September. What was so interesting about this format, though, was that he and I got to scrunch around this little iPod, this iPhone, and, and it created this intimate environment, not in a nasty sort of way, but this environment where we were both looking and he was telling me this very emotional story. And then as he, as he pulled me in, he had photos of these children drinking filthy water, you know, moms pouring filthy water into these big jugs. And I could zoom in with the iPhone. I could zoom in and see the detail and zoom out. And he just clicked through the whole thing. And I give to his charity. We donate every month. It was very, very compelling. And this is a way to get your story across in a one-to-one -one way that's very powerful. So the most important um, thing you need to remember is with a presentation, the big, the big thing you're looking for is to get results. You're either wanting to sell a product or have someone join your cause um, or whatever it is. And I have a great quote. Um, this is David Ogilvy, um, who's the founder of what is now Ogilvy Mather. And he made this statement. He said, you know, when I write an advertisement, I don't want you to tell me that you find it creative. I want you to find it so interesting that you buy the product. Because when Askany spoke, they said, wow, how well he speaks. But when Demosthenes spoke, they said, let us march against Philip. The difference between Askanes and Demosthenes is Askanes, they said, wow, he's a really great presenter. But when Demosthenes spoke, they actually took action and changed history. And I think that's a lot about what Al Gore did. He actually made a change in history. He wasn't a good presenter when he started off. I mean, everybody knows the transformation he's gone through. They could have said, oh, wow, he spoke really great. But in this particular case, he actually created action and got results. So I kind of want to end the way I started it off, which is we're all different. We all have our unique thumbprint. We all have our unique mark that we're meant to leave on the earth. I, I was a weird little kid. I mean, I used to sit and sort, and I used to sit and use things to tell stories. Everything I did, I would sit down, and it would tell some sort of story. Yeah, I was a weird kid. I, let's just leave it at I was a really weird kid. 
but I also I also knew I was different, and I also got really um, good at embracing the fact that I was very different. And there's a woman who I just admire, like probably more than anyone else I know, who made a difference, and that's Martha Graham and the impact that she had on ballet. The one thing that was the most different about Martha after hundreds of years of ballet history, she was a pretty accomplished dancer, but what Martha did that nobody before her had ever done was she would express her soul on the stage. She would take really dark topics like lamenting and weeping and wrap herself in stretchy fabric and struggle to get out of it. Or she would dance in ways nobody had thought to dance, but whatever she did, it was her own unique expression and nobody else had ever expressed herself that way. So I want to let you know that there is a vitality and a life force and an energy and a quickening that's translated through you into action. And because there is only one of you in all of time, this expression is unique. And if you block it, it will never exist through any other medium, and it'll be lost forever. So I really want to thank you guys for participating, and I want to encourage you to tap into that natural born, unique self and embrace it. Don't feel bad that you're different, but embrace who you are and, and strengthen it and leverage it and, and become better at who you are. And I really want to thank you, and I'll, I'll take questions and stuff now. Nancy, do you have time for a few questions? If the audience does, it looks like I cut it close with all the technical delays. Did you sort through some of them? You did, and, and there are quite a few good ones here. Um, I, the first one, let me, it was about knowing your audience. Oh, I think it was Eileen asked it and said, um, isn't knowing your audience part of the giving a good presentation? Yeah. And she wanted to know, how do you tell a story to a bunch of number crunchers? <laughs> You know, you, you, ha you can't tell a ton of stories to a bunch of number crunchers because they are the analytical type. But I think the structure itself can tell a story. Like if it's chronological and you're going over the history of the company, you can tell stories, oh, this is where this happened and this is where that happened and this was the history behind that. So, so it's not like you start to go off on a great big long story of some fantasy story. You have to be very careful because if they were then asked to go and present that same thing to the marketing folks, it better be filled with stories and a way to um, engage emotionally. So it, I would say cautiously if it's a bunch of finance folks, but I also know that they will connect in a, they will connect to the content if it's not just running through the numbers. And Matthew has a similar question. He wanted to know um, about, you made a point about techies in your audience. Mm -hmm. And he says he's read your book, but he wants to know if you have specific tips for presenters that have to offer, present technical like source code in their presentations. You know. And he was, he was especially interested in your Java presentation, wanted to know if you went on to show code. Yeah, it's interesting. It, I, this is the top question that I get is from, you know, I don't have a choice. I have a very technical audience and a technical boss and, and they won't let me deviate or whatever. And so we do, we're planning to write an e-book specifically to the technical and scientific markets because it is quite a bit different in how you need to convey um, your messages in those cases. When we present code, because um, we do work on a lot of developers' conferences and stuff like that, we'll actually, um, there are ways to show it well. It, obviously, we always try to use a font that coders use the most, but we also will have it scroll. So when it's a set of code that needs to stick together and they can see the context of what's happening, there's ways to highlight the part you're talking about and then scroll, um, scroll the text up. So um, it's kind of hard to explain over the phone without actually showing, but I, we're hoping to get an e-book out with, by uh, Christmas time with the answering kind of the scientific and engineering kind of requests that we're getting a lot of. That's great. Um, Andrew wants to know if there are any tips on presenting bad news information that makes the audience uncomfortable, but that in reality they should be aware of? Yeah, I think that um, bad news is a big one. And I think a lot of times, sometimes like HR departments have to present bad news or, or finances to a group. And I, I think the interesting part about bad news is the humanness of the presenter and how they present it. And, and when a company has to present bad news, they have to think about what is what, how is the audience going to react to this? Are they going to be emotional? Are they going to be afraid? Are they going to want to quit their jobs? Are they going to want to dump their stock? And you have to think through what their reaction is, and you have to deal with it right then and acknowledge that I know this is what's on your mind, and it, it, ha it was on my mind too, and all of those kinds of things. You can't 
gloss over it, and, and you also have to say, here's what you can do about it, or here's the response to this news I would love you to take on, but you have to let them go off and deal with it themselves. Um, I don't think your slides should look happy if it's bad news. They could maybe be hopeful at the end when you're done. You need to give them hope, but I, but I feel like if it's bad news, you need to deal with it square on, and your slides should support that. That sounds good. Um, Nigel is asking, and I don't think he means with regard to bad news, but he said, do you recommend the use of humor? And if so, what advice would you give? Humor's good. I think that it's a little cliche to use a, a quick joke as an icebreaker. I think that's kind of annoying. But I think if, if you can use humor in a natural way and you pause at the right time and all of that, I think it's fantastic. Some people aren't inherently funny. And that's where I think video or audio, if you do it right, it can be very funny to kind of compliment if you're a really dry person and or have a dry presentation style, then I think you can actually supplement um, and put humor in through video and stuff like that. But humor is very important. Um, I don't know if I would insert it when you're delivering really bad financial news. Um, so there's obviously timing is very important. Good. Um, Jonathan Singer is asking if you have recommendations for academic audiences. And he says specifically, yeah. my students have to learn details to pass tests. Therefore, my presentations include a lot of information. So right. how do you handle that? I really like, so when, when an uh, academic is presenting, I really feel they need to have visuals as a mnemonic device for the students to remember. And not enough people use the notes view of the slides. You can put a book practically in the notes view where you actually put what the students need to know in the notes, and then you can actually PDF your slides and post it with the miniature of the slides and all of the notes. So they have the visual cue that they learned in class, and then you can fit a ton more in the notes view than you can even fit on your slides. So you can actually put more than less um, in the notes view, and that's what I recommend, though I know this isn't possible all the time, um, and there are times where there needs to be more words on the slide than, than you know, should be. Right. And then, do you have time for another question? Sure. OK, Alan is asking, I love how you give permission to liberate ourselves from the confines of how PowerPoint is traditionally used. Thanks for that. What's the most effective way to get people to take the first steps towards the kind of storytelling you advocate? You know, I think that's why I address the well, you've got to get willing to break the mold a bit. And I, I think if you, the biggest thing it takes is some guts. And and what happens, I know, in, in when there's a lot of peer pressure to be a conformist, just getting the guts to be able to be different and to do it differently will help if that's the first step. Um, we're actually watching transformations happen in organizations where they're adopting these principles, and it's making a difference, but it's a couple of very tenacious people that are insisting they change the way they communicate that's making all the difference in the world. So I would say it's going to take guts and a ton of tenacity. Great. And let me see, there was one other question. I think it's the same sort of thing. Um, oh, no, it was just a comment and uh, another person saying that that PowerPoint's often seen as a crutch that presenters yeah. will use as a safety blanket because at the end of the day you can read the slides. And he says it's brutal as an attendee, but it's safe. And I think that's just his comment on, on what you were saying. Yeah, it is weird. They, they, it is this weird crutch. It's like a, it's like a filter or a, a, a blanket, like their little blinky. You know, we want to keep it on stage to have it as a safety net. And it also makes us, it doesn't require us to go and learn our material. We don't have to ingest it because we, oh, well, I'll have it there on, on the slide as a crutch. And it's just frustrating for the audience. So we need to change that behavior. Okay. And one more question about the e-book that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Where will we, are you publishing this yourself or? Yeah, it'll be up on the blog and on the O'Reilly site. Um, okay, so you cool. can look at it for there, yeah. Good, good. Well, I think, I think that's all we have time for today. Well, and thanks, I everyone. I love wanted, the participation. And thank you for bearing with us through the technical difficulties. I think we got over them quickly. And for anyone who wasn't able to see the slides, which were really amazing, you'll want to go back and see them. We'll have a recording of this available, and we'll send a note to you, an email to you when they're, when it's um, up. It takes us about a week, usually. Or you can check on our webcast at a webcast.oreilly.com page, and it'll be posted there. 
And Nancy, people were asking, are you going to share these slides? What's your, what's your uh, philosophy about that? Oh, you mean like post them as PowerPoint somewhere or whatever? Yeah, post them on um, your slide share or something like that. Well, some of the images, I licensed all the images, but some of them I didn't license for um, the release of it. But it'll be up on, on the webinar. They should be able to see the slides there. They'll be able to see it there. Yeah. So, so she's not posting the slides, but you will be able to view the recording. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much.